We'll wait for a couple viewers trickle in uh, on this joyous Tuesday here in the United Corporations of America. I got the right guy to explain uh, fact and fiction uh, in the new Biden administration, uh, which unfortunately for Rudy Giuliani and many others is uh, going to happen, it seems. Uh, smash that like button. Uh, we already got uh, about 50 people watching, so keep smashing that like button. We are on our march. We are on our march to 100,000 subscribers. Steve, it seems like yesterday, just yesterday, we, you and I were talking uh, and uh, we were being suppressed on YouTube. We still are, uh, but we're finally making some movement uh, to getting out of YouTube's cave. Uh, so it's very positive. And of course, if you don't know Steve, uh, Real Progressives, he's the uh, co-founder and does great work there. Um, Steve, how you been? I've been good, man. Thank you very much for having me on, yeah. brother. And congratulations on breaking through the, the glass ceiling of YouTube. Man. <laughs> well, while, the, while they still allow us on, yes, very, very, very good. Um, please smash the like button. Uh, share this with as many uh, people as you can. Um, also, definitely, definitely, if you didn't watch the show yesterday, check out the last video we published. Uh, Headline, simply, we got hacked. I don't even know if you know this. Uh, we just found out our website was hacked. Uh, so wow. we have been hemorrhaging paid members, which, as you know, is kind of the lifeblood of any indie media outlet. Uh, we've lost a hell of a lot of members since um, COVID in March. We thought it was simply due to the economy, but we learned a few days ago that we were actually maliciously hacked, not just like a rando hacker, but we oh, were wow. actually targeted and uh, there was over 100 viruses in our back end. So we have uh, a web developer right now cleaning up our website and we have instructed uh, people to check. You might think you're a member to status quo, uh, but we're starting to realize a lot of people were incorrectly made inactive. Uh, so I'll, I'll re-explain that later. But uh, let's get right to it, uh, Steve. And um, so, you know, the brunch crowd is, is joyous. Um, you got... Biden coming in, uh, we're starting to see announcements today of people he is putting in his administration. Uh, one that stuck out to me was Mike Donilon as his senior advisor. This guy is a Democratic Party lifer, uh, corporate Democratic Party lifer, I should say. Uh, he has worked on the campaigns of progressive stalwarts like Joe Lieberman, um, Chris Dodd, <laughs> Al Gore, John Kerry. Uh, John Corzine. So gives you kind of an idea. His senior advisor has worked on every neoliberal, uh, cap pro capitalist, military industrial complex, uh, neoliberal campaign of the last probably 30 years. Uh, we also see he's bringing on Cedric Richmond. Uh, he's a Louisiana senator, or excuse me, Louisiana congressman, who I believe takes out of all congressmen the most money from oil and gas down there in Louisiana. Uh, he is putting Cedric Richmond in as the liaison between business and <laughs> environmentalists. You can't make this up. The guy who, <laughs> the guy who makes the most money in donations from big oil. Um, and, you know, there's some other fillers. Uh, we don't have to go through the whole list. But basically, your generic Chamber of Commerce, corporate Democrats. Um, as of now, I don't see any Bernie people. I don't even see any Warren people. Um, so we'll get to that in a bit. But I wanted to ask you, because Biden gave this big economic speech yesterday. Um, essentially, the speech was heavy on pass the HEROES Act, which was Pelosi and the Democrats' proposal about six, seven months ago. Uh, the original HEROES Act was $3 trillion. Um, extension of unemployment. I uh, think about, uh, I think, nearly a trillion to go to state and local governments, which I actually have an issue with. Every, all economists say that's wonderful, but when you read the fine print, Steve, as you know, a lot of times they say money's going to states and cities and somehow it gets redirected to donors, nonprofits, real estate developers, and whatnot. But on, on first blush, President-elect Biden, his economic plan seems to be pass the HEROES Act, nothing about expanding health care, and 
I'm not hearing anything about direct stimulus or anything like that. Um, should people be excited and, you know, the rescue choppers are coming if you're in economic despair? Now, if I, if I, if I had my druthers, I would have you run the clip of our last interview <laughs> where I basically say this Biden administration is going to be a Republican administration through and through, basically. And, yeah, you know, I, you know, I, he's going to be a more effective Republican than Trump was. That's the problem. And, you know, his uh, his advisors are stacking up to be nothing. Not, I mean, there's nothing surprising to me at all about this. This is what Joe Biden is. This is what they are. I will tell you, the HEROES Act, the original one was over three trillion dollars. Um, it was still not good enough then. It's now down to $2.2 trillion, and it's still not good enough. Trump administration and their lame duck uh, is offering up $1.6 trillion in stimulus, and it's republicanized, of course. Um, so, no, none of this is anything good. Um, anything is better than nothing, let's be clear, but it's not good. It's not anything to be excited about, and it's most definitely indicative of you know, what's going to happen over the next however long Biden stays in office, uh, coupled with, uh, you know, if Harris takes over or anything else like that. It, you're, it's going to be much ado about nothing. There are no progressives in that lineup whatsoever. Um, and, you know, again, I mean, Biden has done nothing whatsoever to let anyone believe that he is, in fact, going to be a progressive. He's not a progressive, has never been a progressive. And, you know, I mean, there's an Intercept article going back a ways where they talked about how, you know, Biden pushed Reagan to the right to, to try to uh, be even harder on crime. So, I mean, there's absolutely nothing anyone will tell me about Biden that will be shocking in the least. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, if we get any stimulus out of this, if we get any kind of relief, I, you know, it, it, it'll be a minor mirror. So... It'll be a uh, couple PSAs. Remember, smash that like button. Already got over 200 watching. Uh, smash the like button. Thumbs up right under the video. Helps get the audience up. Uh, also, this is a super chat, so keep them coming. Thank you very much. John, five bucks. Thanks for having Steve on. What they're doing over there at Real Progressives is nothing short of amazing. Thanks, status quo. Love you guys. I agree. They're a scrappy bunch over at Real Progressives. Uh, where can people find uh, Real Progressives, Steve? So we're at www.realprogressives.org, uh, and you can find our podcast, which is our flagship right now, which is Macro, the letter N, cheese. Um, so you can find us over there. We're on Facebook, and we're on YouTube under Real Progress in Action and uh, our sister channel, which is Real Progressives. Yeah, so we'll go back over that later when we have uh, a higher audience. Also, homework. Uh, status quo, if you're on our email list, which you should be, Check your email right now because Jen just sent you a critically, critically important email. If you don't see it, check your spam. Uh, we just sent you an email explaining that we were hacked. If you missed the show yesterday, that explaining we believe that hack has led to potentially over three, between 300 and 400 purged members, meaning members that were made inactive. They didn't cancel, but their payments didn't go through. Uh, as I explained yesterday, your financial information is 100% safe, uh, but the hack led to several vi a lot of viruses on our website, and it seems that it indirectly or directly led to payments not going through, uh, so that's a big reason we've lost so many members. So Jen just sent you an email explaining it and telling you uh, the process to check your membership to make sure you're active, and if you've gone inactive... Uh, how you could reactivate. So definitely uh, go check your email now. So I want to I want to get into it. We'll get back into you know the people that Biden is surrounding himself. But you know the neoliberal uh, line was Heroes Act is amazing because it gives money for states and local governments, which they say is desperately needed. When I say they, the Democratic Party is saying that's desperately needed. It continued this unemployment. Uh, the Democrats wanted it at six hundred dollars a week. Uh, in fairness, that $600 a week did keep a lot of people afloat, but the problem was it was a bureaucratic mess for m a lot of people to actually receive it. And then there was other things, um, PPP program extension, contract tracing, all those things. 
But I think what Biden is talking about, which is basically pushing the HEROES Act through, is one part of the puzzle. And I think it's inadequate. The other part is, what is Joe Biden and the Democratic Party going to do about the long-term unemployment disaster afoot? I mean, if you look, in, if you look at the numbers, um, you, had, you have almost 5 million people in September. So I didn't look at the numbers in October yet. Over 5 million people in September were unemployed for 15 weeks or more. Then you had uh, 2.5 million were unemployed for 27 weeks or more. I, they, I don't know. The Labor Department says 27 weeks or more is long-term unemployed. I don't know. That seems arbitrary to me. To me, if you've been unemployed for 15 weeks or more, that's long-term unemployment. But the bottom line is we're, we're headed towards 7 to 10 million people that have been unemployed long-term. We're heading into the dark winter with COVID. And frankly, even when that vaccine is distributed, you know where we live. We're not in a country. We're in a co corporation. A lot of these jobs aren't coming back even when there is a vaccine. So to me, okay, maybe the HEROES Act would be the short-term Band-Aid, but I see kind of a sequel to the financial crash of 2008 where a lot of these jobs don't come back, but the unemployment number might go down. So Democrats and Biden will declare the economy is improving. Yeah, I think Joe Biden has proven, you know, his the people that he surrounded himself with, um, that, that they're not going to really do anything. There's a lot of people, to be fair, that are hoping that they can push him. OK, there's a lot of people out there saying Biden's in his last lap, that he might be a legacy guy, that they're seeing cracks in the armor, that they're seeing you know, movement and so forth. Um, it, it, it is extremely possible that the simple numbers of COVID and the fact that we're already trending hockey stick wise up with more cases, uh, looking at lockdowns once again, that's going to create a whole new set of long-term unemployed people uh, with or without a vaccine. Um, and the fact that we're heading into the winter months when we already have other illnesses that typically creep around during that time could create major, major economic chaos uh, for the rank and file people. Forget the corporations. I mean, just Joe public. And so my suspicion is, is that they, they don't really have an answer to any of these things. They, in, during their um, unity platform with uh, Sanders, uh, economic advisors, et cetera, I previously told you that they rejected a federal job guarantee. Um, there has been proposals out there for nationalizing payroll. Um, there has been a lot of movement. I mean, we had the ABC Act, which was something that Ron Gray had put forward with Rashida Tlaib, uh, and that was to give people um, you know, direct payments using EBT cards, et cetera. Um, that hasn't seen the light of day. So there's an awful lot of inactivity and lack of uh, what I consider to be uh, a commitment to regular people uh, to help them. I mean, we, we know empirically by the types of people that he's putting on his staff, the types of uh, focus that he is going to have in terms of that economic pressure. And you can only hope that the AOCs of the world, Rashida Tlaib's and the whole squad actually push him. I don't think Biden's going to be pushed, to be perfectly honest with you. And I see no meaningful, um, I see no meaningful legislation. Now you said something very specifically about the payments to the states. And let me just say this. States are very much cash strapped and they are very much revenue constrained by their taxes and the um, the various investments that they have as bondholders at the state level. Everything from their, their pension programs to basic fundamental services, you name it, tied directly to tax receipts. With the economic activity crawling at the state level, it's very, very important that the states do get funding. Now, what that funding looks like, though, should be very different than what I suspect it will be. To your point, instead of the sweetheart deals to these non-essential things, it would be nice to see block grants given to the states with direct targets towards certain things that will make those states survive these tough times. Uh, right now, I don't see that happening. Uh, it doesn't mean that it won't, but I don't see any movement whatsoever. I, don't, I haven't heard of any bills out there that are recommending block grants to the states. And, and this HEROES Act, to your point, is very, very, very uh, inadequate. It, it needs to be significantly larger because not only do we have to recoup the lost 
uh, you know, monies for the people that, that have happened over the course of this time and, and the debts they've incurred. But we also have to keep them going and afloat through that time as we lose more and more and more workers as they do shut this economy back down. There's no getting around it. it, it you're already starting to see the states clamping down again. You're starting to see, again, the state of Pennsylvania, um, they're, they're putting more restrictions on, uh, more restrictions on entry into buildings, more restrictions on wearing masks, more restrictions and so forth that are going to impact the economy. So without a really bold answer to that question, I, I, I don't see very, very good things happening, Heroes Act or not. And something else, I mean, we, we don't have five hours to go through Obama's legacy, but Obama basically let, you know, working people go belly up. He let the foreclosures, foreclosure uh, crisis go unabated, uh, basically because, you know, Wall Street, in large part, funded his whole campaign. So we have a moratorium. You know, it keeps getting kind of kicked. The kick, the can keeps getting kicked down the road. They keep extending the moratorium on evictions, this and that. But as you know, I mean, real estate developers, landlords, uh, uh, banks own a lot of these mortgages and things like that. Eventually, you know, they're going to want their money. And Joe Biden works for them. The Democratic Party works for them. So short of hearing rent is going to be canceled from March to uh, till vaccine distribution, not just the rent is canceled, but you know, you got to look out for the landlords. They're not all mega banks. Uh, so landlords too, you know, their mortgage payments canceled, whatever. Um, you just, there's a ticking time bomb waiting to happen. And I, it, it seems very remnant of what Obama did. I'm not hearing any language from uh, Biden or anybody on the team he's assembling. What are you going to do about these evictions. You could keep extending the moratorium, but let's say best case scenario, vaccine is widely distributed distributed in um, by April. Uh, you're going to have nearly a year's rent. <laughs> all due. Maybe they'll maybe they'll yeah. do some deals for tenants that you could pay it back over years. So you're going to have on top of your student loans a year's worth of rent. Uh, you got to start paying back every month on top of your current rent. So it just seems to me it's, it's not a matter of if there's going to be a mass eviction crisis, um, at, which leads to homelessness and all other things. It's just when. And I'm not hearing. I don't know any other. I don't know any other way other than you either cancel the rent or you do what Europe's doing and you give direct UBI and or have government cover the payrolls so these people can still pay their rent. Yeah, you know, what What I'm very concerned about is, you know, recently in the Wall Street Journal, they were already setting the stage for this is just a natural course of business. This is just a natural flow of the business cycle. These things happen, you know. They retrench, the the, the uh, people go bankrupt, they give up their land, the, the investors come in, they buy it up, they do this stuff, and it's just a natural way of things, Right. And, and I believe, that unfortunately, many of your listeners, my listeners, uh, the, the average voting uh, American has no concept of the power of the federal government to alter that cycle. And, and because of that, they accept this idea that, you know, there's just nothing we can do about it. And, and they really believe that because they're, they're hell-bent in believing that somehow or another the government's broken and it can't do these things. And it's that paradigm right there. I, I speak to it frequently, but it's that paragraph, uh, paradigm right there that is literally keeping us in chains. And, and they're going to play to that. Biden will play to that. I mean, he said in, in various uh, forums that we have the money, we have the money, we have the ability, we have the money. He says these things, but then you don't see any of the real follow-up in terms of policy, old policy proposals, nothing. Um, and, and, you know, my fear here is, is that we, because we don't believe it, we don't understand that the federal government creates money every time it spends. We're just so accustomed to the government not having any money to pay us, to, to give us anything good in our lives. We're so used to getting the shit kicked out of us that we accept that we're, 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 we're just used to being dumped on and we take it. And, and I think that 
until we accept the fact that our government can, in fact, and must, in fact, fix these things. We aren't going to demand of a Biden administration. We aren't going to be able to force them left. We aren't going to be able to do anything like that because the people won't make those demands themselves. And until they make those demands themselves, Biden will appeal to the people that are making the most noise. And that is not just my kids upstairs, but that's also these Wall Street folks that want their money, like you said. You look at the things he said in his economic speech yesterday, which dare I say was a little low energy. He basically was saying, I'm not going to we won't hand out government contracts uh, to companies that offshore jobs. OK, well, Obama said there was going to be no lobbyists in his administration that lasted for about 15 minutes. So then he says, uh, you know, as part of his build back better plan, they're going to give incentives to companies that build make in America. We've heard this, too from previous Democratic administrations. But on the other end, uh, you and I were talking. Uh, I didn't hear CNBC or anybody pick this up. But at the end of his speech, he was asked a question, I think, by a financial reporter about uh, not the TPP, a different trade deal that is going through right now that involves China. And he was giving some language, Steve, that made me think, you give this guy a couple days, maybe a month, they'll change some sentences, move some commas, and say... We renegotiated the TPP. It's now more fair to labor and environmentalists. And this is a badly needed trade deal right now as the economy is free falling. And they're going to ram TPP in, which maybe you could explain uh, because it's not a sexy topic. But remember, when Ed Schultz was still with us, uh, RIP, he was fired from MSNBC basically for being the only anchor on MSNBC that would speak out against the TPP. Could you kind of explain to the audience Were you reading what Biden said yesterday in his plan, uh, in his speech, similar to me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think the bottom line is, is that, you know, we're fooling ourselves if we want to believe that Biden is not a globalist, a a neoliberal globalist enabler. And the the he was definitely speaking to the fact that we can't allow China to be the only ones. It's like echoes of Obama. We can't allow China to be the only one controlling commerce blah, blah, blah. And so, yes, Biden is absolutely prepping to have uh, some sort of a trade deal. This is going to be key because that is neoliberal economic policy. Um, You know, they can put all the, you know, we're going to protect workers. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. But that's what Obama said. That's what Clinton said with CAFTA and NAFTA. That's what each of them say. It's what they always say. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, we won't know until we see it. But exactly what you said is exactly how I interpreted it. I mean, first of all, again, it's very important to understand that neoliberals are now going to be fully in just completely enmeshed in our government. And and there's nothing we can do about it short of resist and expect it and fight back. That That's really all we got. And so you can expect a, a TPP like deal coming any time now. It's very disconcerting. And, you know, the human toll here, uh, I don't I don't have the video right now, but I just saw the other day there was like lines down the highway in Texas. It looked like a hurricane where people are, you know, literally down the highway, uh, you know, on lines for gas or something like that. Downs lines down the highway in Texas uh, for food. Um, We're seeing food banks all over the country. Um, You're basically seeing small business owners saying, fuck it, I, you know, I have to risk my life and, and staying open uh, because the PPP program was totally inadequate. Frankly, a lot of that PPP money got raided. Uh, money meant for small businesses went to swine like the judge on Shark Tank, who's a multimillionaire. Other donors got PPP money that should have never been eligible. Uh, so to me, you know, even if you wanted to do, play devil's advocate and say, well, you know, Biden doesn't have a wand, uh, maybe he's not as progressive as you and Steve, but give him some time. Well, the bottom line is why it's the same principle for why can't we be like other countries that give universal health care? Uh, why aren't we doing what Europe's doing? It seems that Europe sees the magnitude of the crisis and is meeting that magnitude with the appropriate response, which is we don't need this whole bureaucratic mess of multiple programs, PPP program unemployment, all these things, the government can print money. That's what MMT is about. The government could just print the money 
And isn't this the time to put the neoliberal narrative? And it would be good, by the way, for Wall Street, which runs the country. It would be good for Wall Street to print the money so that everybody would have UBI. Small business owners could stay open. Um, Why do you think it is that, I mean, we don't know because he's not in there yet, but he has said nothing about either direct stimulus payments, uh, direct, not checks once a month, but monthly. He said nothing about that. And he, and he said nothing about uh, his, his advice. He has a COVID advisor who kind of vaguely said, if we have to have a lockdown, maybe we would cover payrolls. But that was the most I've heard of the government covering payrolls. Why won't they do that if it would be beneficial for their donors? Well, it's about power too, right? So when, when we, we look at money, money is not what these people are dealing in. They're dealing in land. They're dealing in resources. They're dealing in real wealth. The cash is nice. It's king. For us, we, the people that flourish in this economy or drown in this economy. But for those people, it's about ownership. It's about power. It's about being able to make decisions and calls. And by leaving us desperate, and allowing them to have control and retrench into that, um, you know, they can resell those things on the do- you know on the cheap. They can resell the world on the cheap. Everything that we lose when the economy goes bad, they come in and buy, and then they resell it back to us at a at a different price, right? So they get to make money no matter which way they go. And Jamie Dimon is famous for saying. That, you know, hey, these recessions and depressions, they're really bad for Jane and Joe public, but they're pretty good for us over here at J.P. Morgan. And and there's a reason for that is because they get to buy up everything and then resell it. They get to set the market. They get to make the determinations of what happens and what doesn't happen. So, so much of this is based on them being able to create speculator markets, being able to have access to real resources on the cheap. And, and, and really, at the end of the day, it's about the business cycle benefiting capital once again and leaving the people out the dry. And Joe Biden is a servant of capital. He is, regardless of whether people want him to be a good guy or not. No amount of blue brain is going to change the fact that Biden is a lifelong neoliberal. And, and this is who he is. This is what he is. And Harris is a Clinton uh, devotee, sycophant, whatever you want to call her. She is one of the people right on the heels of Clinton, and they both share the same ideological view. So nothing will fundamentally change. He is a capitalist, and he is absolutely your standard Reagan Republican. And and that that doesn't serve them to spend on the people. It serves them to allow that natural business cycle to take place where people lose, business takes over, resells and starts the economy back up again in that way. It creates opportunity through everyone's misery. And that's standard neoliberal, you know, that's that's what they do. That's, that's the neoliberal game plan, man. I wish I could say it was different, but people don't listen. They, they get swept up in the goodness of the D and they forget that neoliberals are going to be neoliberals. It's not a matter of whether they're a Democrat or Republican. They're going to eat us for dinner. And, um, and that's pretty much what I'm afraid is going to happen. And uh, remember, we got almost 500 people watching, so smash the like button right under the video. Thumbs up. More people that press the like button, we can get this audience much higher. Um, so let's move from Biden to the Republicans, because I think it's all connected. You got, I mean, unless something, unless the Democrats win both of these runoffs in Georgia, which I think is unlikely, uh, McConnell and his neck will maintain control. And what's, I mean, I think McConnell, uh, there's going to be a mad, mad hunger games to maintain the 72 million votes that Trump got. Because what, if you're, if you're McConnell, what is a better proposition? Republicans maintaining most of those votes or Democrats when Trump is not on the ballot in 2024 getting 78 million votes. I think you're going to see a lot of people drop out when Trump is no longer the boogeyman on the ballot on the Democratic side. So you're going to have McConnell uh, trying to block everything. Uh, The Republicans are suddenly going to have, you know, a resurgence of, you know, the debt fairy. uh, And we can't keep spending money. We've spent too much. And I fear that we're going to have the same theater that we've had under Obama and others pretend uh, if Biden, you know, He ran on. I'm the one who could break through this partisan divide. I'm the one who could strike deals with Republicans. The fever will break, so to speak. But I think Biden's going to be able to throw up his hands and say, 
What can I do? Mitch McConnell is blocking everything. Guaranteed. I mean, the, the lone the lone potential salvation is is that Biden came out and said he's got a, a Rolodex full of executive orders ready to roll to repeal some of the more egregious Trump acts, you know, that, that he performed. So that's one lone yay rah moment right there that I think maybe could benefit us in some way, shape or form. But I think, honestly, that the Republicans, unlike the Democrats, understand that being out of power can actually be a good thing. They, 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 they have much more power to obstruct. And, and if you're a conservative, your goal is to maintain the status quo. You know what I mean? That's, that's your goal. And, and so obstruction is as good as policy, right? They just want to be left alone in their mind, right, and, and keep the business cycle going. Well, they'll, they'll have that opportunity. It's not going to – they don't lose anything by being out of control. The, the Democrats, however, act like unless they have the White House, unless they have they, – they're completely powerless. They can't do anything. I mean we know what happened with Obama with the ACA, for example. He took the public option off the table before they even got started. You know, there was a meeting I think it was a month before the uh, the actual election where he met with lobbyists and they, they had already taken it off the table. They, you know, any – any kind of hand waving about oh the Republicans buy that's just not true. He had a supermajority and still didn't do anything with it. And so you know I can only imagine, and it's already happening by the way. I'm watching regular voters say oh we can't expect much from Biden. He's got a Republican Senate to deal with. We can't expect much. But that didn't stop the Republicans from cramming things. So that didn't stop the Republicans from fighting like tooth and nail for what they wanted. At all. Republican, the Republicans would have uh, got rid of Obamacare if not for McCain's, you know, vote. Absolutely. So I, my suspicion is, is that, you know, the, the, the Republicans are happy either way. If, if Trump does lose, then what they'll do is for the next four years, they'll do what Bernie did. And they'll have Trump be in a perpetual running cycle. He'll be the thorn in the side of everyone. He'll be there keeping his minions going. For the next four years, we didn't gain or lose. He's going to be even more powerful in a sense, out of power, with the freedom to just kind of continue this thing. This Trumpism, MAGA, is going to continue. And and so my suspicion is, is that the Republicans understand that they can win both ways. And the Democrats, however, always go beta and give up the belly like a dog you know, whenever they're out of power and they're already ready to tell you that the Republicans are going to block them. They can't get anything done. Well, is them. So my suspicion will be that nothing will fundamentally change. And I don't think it's much suspicion. Joe Biden said it directly. And uh, we got 500 people watching. So keep smashing that like button right under the video. Thumbs up. Share this live stream. Uh, keep those super chats coming. We just got another one. Thank you. Green Party 2020 499. Appreciate it. So let's talk about progressives because you know i mean as always progressives like to fight each other and uh eat each other's own uh you got kind of the jimmy door school of thought burn it all down uh we need a new party um you know aoc even the squad uh he has criticisms of uh and then you have you know progressives and the squad and bernie which is let's keep chipping away we've won seats in congress in 2018 now 2020, we got Jamal Bowman coming in, Corey Bush, uh, with the Democratic Party now having a narrow majority in the House because they're totally, you know, a disaster and lost to Republicans. They were supposed to grow their House majority. They lost seats. Actually, that squad, so to speak, uh, those seven to ten progressives, their votes actually start to get more powerful because if the Democratic Party in the House loses the progressives vote, they don't have that majority because their majority was narrowed. Uh, what do you think? Because I've told my audience, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I think there's a better chance of me growing a six pack by the end of the year than moving Biden left. So what can progressives do? So, you know, you spoke of Jimmy Dore and you spoke of the squad side, et cetera. And I think that we have to look at both angles here, right? I think that the Democratic Party um, has proven to us once and for all that they have more centrist numbers that, that, that they're not going to go out to the streets. They're not going to be a part of a, you know, a rally. They're, they're just the older voters. They're voters that are just watch MSNBC. 
um, still red scare, you know, uh, fearful uh, people. Um, and they've got huge number. And that's why they were able to collapse the establishment around Bernie Sanders. I mean, Bernie was winning if nobody drops out of the race. But once Bernie drops, you know, keeps going and the others drop out, you see that the centrist uh, majority is a super majority in that party. I mean, we, we are a small group compared to what centrists are, unfortunately. And, and you look at all the disaffected voters in the world, the people that have checked out that are no longer part of a party, and you start to see that there is a real opportunity for progressives to build a third party. So that said, I, I support any effort that applies pressure to the system that will allow us to do it. That said, the people that are going to be passing legislation today, for those people that are going to die tomorrow, that may have COVID today, that you know are homeless or jobless or whatever, they need legislation now. They don't need your piety. They need legislation right the hell now. They need help right now. And unfortunately, there are no third parties right now passing legislation because they're not in power right now. So you got to have an inside-outside strategy because the inside isn't going to do anything without pressure from the outside. So I like to think of non-electoral uh, energies to pushing for, you know, real honest to God change in, in terms of, you know, domestic policy, foreign policy, you name it. And so I think that progressives need to really be uniting around what it is that they want, not around the party per se, not around the personalities, but the actual things that they want. Medicare for all. You saw that the people that won the elections were people that supported Medicare for all. The people that didn't support Medicare for all lost the elections. And that's a fact, Jack. So if you start looking at what is a progressive and what does a progressive want, and we unite behind that and we, we punch anyone that goes against it, that's the thing. We punch anyone that goes against it. We don't defend Biden. We don't defend AOC even. If AOC is wrong, we, we recognize that she's wrong. And that's the only way that progressives are going to really be able to push anyone. This whole idea of, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, we're okay, now let's go to brunch – that's cancerous. That's really, really bad stuff. So, you know, while Jimmy, I have my issues with Jimmy Dore and I have my issues with the Dem Enter strategy, I don't have issues with the platform that we all kind of want, regardless of which angle of strategy we're taking. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to break out the commie card here for a <laughs> minute. If you go back to Lenin and, and what is to be done and, you know, some of his writings back then, especially in the last chapters, he starts talking about a unified media the ability to have propaganda, the ability to agitate. We've got to remember these things. We've got to remember what it's like to unite on the issues, not on the parties. The parties divide us, unfortunately. And by being divided by party, instead of being united on our principles and our values, regardless of whether we're thinking third party or thinking Democrat, I think that we lose. The only way we win is to unite around those issues and, and really start remembering what it's like to create a union picket line, to start remembering what it's like to actually bring commerce to a halt, to stop traffic, to stop things, and to, to make bold, direct action. Those days, a lot of union tactics are now illegal. They've made being a union very, very challenging. So the one thing I'd like to see is you see the public sector unions right now, those public sector unions are very strong, the teachers union, the nurses. Uh, there's a bunch of different unions out there that really have some power to influence and to pressure and to push. Now, the question will be, will they push for the right things? Will those unions listen to their membership or will they follow those leaders that take baths in the bathhouses of Washington, D.C. together? And I, so I think a lot of it's going to come down to non-electoral, strength in numbers, issue-oriented fighting. And, and that's, to me, the only way progress is going to be made because the parties, there's no way we win it just in the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is just not going to serve us in that way. It's just not. No matter how much we want it, it's just not. Not without external pressures. So that's where Jimmy's strategy and the third party strategy and the, the whole concept there can work together. I do think that they tend to eat everything. They're like skimming every headline to find some fault with AOC, to find some fault with you know Omar and and all of them. So to that extent, I understand you're 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 talking about politicians, politicians that must make deals and negotiate with one another, and unfortunately, they're part of an apparatus 
that is an establishment apparatus. So they've got to play nicely within there. They have no power otherwise. That's the sucky thing. We don't have the numbers. No matter how much our attitude is there, no matter how much rage and outrage we have, we don't have the numbers in these representative uh, positions. So until we develop the kind of strong backbone from like union-like tactics, I, I don't I don't think we're going to see the kind of change. So progressives, you know, we got some decisions to make. And, and to me, the one thing that we should all be able to unite around, period, the MMT mindset, the idea that the federal government can pay for it all and they're lying to us. If we use that as the cornerstone for what we're fighting for, all of those programs, all of that stuff, all the straw men arguments that they throw at us about affordability go right out the window. And that is the entry point by which we can really, really attack each one of our, our things, a Green New Deal, Medicare for all, ending student debt, all those very important things, eliminating rent, rent moratorium, rent cancellation, COVID payments, you know, the temporary UBI, expanding Social Security, a federal job guarantee, all of that comes with understanding that the federal government can pay for it all. And if we start uniting around that core principle and stop, oh, the private federal, shut up. Just get with the program and deal with the fact that we can afford it. We never talk about the private federal reserve when we bomb the hell out of Yemen and other places. Stop talking about it when we're trying to pay for health care, God damn it. I mean, just focus on what we can do. And that right there, that core principle, if we can do that, I think we can see some change, Jordan. And, uh Give me, uh, give me a moment me, for a quick status quo PSA. PSA. Uh, welcome, PSA. new uh, status quo member. Uh, we got Michael Lucas just signed up. Uh, keep signing up, statusquo.com slash join. Uh, once I finish my interview with Steve, I'm going to explain, uh, again, we need you to go check if you're a status quo member. We need you to go check to make sure your membership is active. We did get hacked. Uh, I'll talk about it once Steve and I wrap but we do need you to check. Uh, you could do that. Uh, I'll show you real quick. Go to statuscoup.com. Let me show you. Statuscoup.com. Hover over, become a member, and you click on subscriptions here. And that way, uh, once you click on subscriptions, it should show you, uh, hold on. You should see under active, it's either going to say yes or no. Uh, if it says no, click resubscribe uh, because as a result of being hacked, uh, a lot of our payments didn't go through. To be clear, your financial information is safe. Our web developers assure us of that. But uh, because we had viruses in our system, the actual payments uh, for a lot of members, we're talking potentially two to 300, didn't go through. So definitely go right now, statuscoup.com. Uh, click on over, over, become a member, click on subscriptions, and then check if your subscription is active. If you have any problems uh, trying to reactivate uh, you can email us, info at statuscoup.com, uh, info at statuscoup.com, uh, if you have any problems. So, Steve, I'm a little mad at you because you literally just stole my next question. I was going to say, Steve, listen, ain't my first rodeo. I've been around the country for five years. I don't want to minimize what Black Lives Matter is doing. I don't want to minimize what Fight for 15 or Climate uh, Sunrise Movement or any of these people are doing. But at, at a certain point, you kind of got to read the tea leaves we could all march around till we're blue in the face. We could march for blocks, for cities, and keep on marching, and the capitalist plutocracy will wait us out. Uh, as long as we're not marching around their yachts, as long as we're not marching around, you know, their summer vineyards, uh, as long as they are, you know, cocooned, they live in their cocoon and we're not disturbing them, they'll say, all right, let them march. You know, the police will bash their heads in. It'll last for six months, and that will be that. So I've been saying, and you said a little bit of this in, in your last uh, answer, uh, the progressive movement, I don't care if it's Dem Exit, Dem Enter, mo Movement for a People's Party, uh, take over the Democratic Party, whatever it is, whatever faction. Progressive movement needs not only to have bodies on the ground, not only bodies outside the White House protesting, but you got to start protesting with your wallet. And uh, we haven't seen that since maybe the 1950s and 60s when there was organized labor was the backbone of the Democratic Party. And we organized labor was a huge, huge force. So we could get concessions from corporate CEOs, corporate America. Uh, but the Republicans and frankly, Bill Clinton and Democratic accomplishments have destroyed organized labor. So to me, I would like to see progressive groups. We know they're not going to go back to sleep under Biden. They're already showing that. But 
where is the economic protest component in terms of can we get enough people to, to uh, strike against Amazon? Not just for a day. Let's start for a week. Maybe we could broaden it. What about fast food companies? What about big banks? What about uh, expanding divestment campaigns? This is the only way Joe Biden is going to move left because the only way you get any politician to move left is to threaten the real rulers, their donors. Your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, we don't like to talk about violence. And, you know, it's usually the first thing we go, oh, no, 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 no. What's can't possibly do that. Um, and I'm not here to advocate for violence, but I do think that the kind of disruptions and agitation that have to occur have to be substantive. They have to be forceful and they have to be pointed and specific. They can't just be kind of loosey goosey and whatever that takes. I'm not going to describe a specific action that I think should or should not take place, but I will tell you that the more timid we are in our demands, the less likely we are to get them met. And, um, you know, I, again, I, I really think it's very important that we get past some of our red scare fears and start looking at how labor once used to unite back in the industrial revolution. There's lessons there to be learned. All of Europe, they, the, the Soviet Union didn't exist at the time. It was just Russians, and, and they, they, the labor forces talked to one another. They, they discussed theory. They discussed praxis. They discussed tactics. They, they, they had underground channels. They, they operated as a system, as an organization, as a group of people that were fighting back. And, of course, you had the Social Democrats of the time who were always ready to make peace with capital, etc., in reality, you look at labor as a whole, and they were very, very serious. They were committed. I think that we need to really examine our history, dig deep and find times where it's been successful, and start trying to model some of those behaviors. Because otherwise, this whole loosey-goosey, I'm okay, you're okay, sitting in the basement, hanging out kind of stuff, that isn't going to get us a Green New Deal. That's not going to get us health care. It really isn't. And, and all the likes and and shares and all the other social media stuff is definitely not going to win the day. It's going to require some form of unified action. Um, you know, and, and I hope that, I hope that people start taking a real hard look at that because without it, we, we don't, we really don't stand a chance. And my last question, uh, everybody seems to think like, Oh, you know, duh, of course the vaccine's going to be free. Not so fast. I was told that coronavirus testing would be free, and I just paid a hundred dollar copay for a coronavirus test. Uh, we were told that treatment for coronavirus would be mostly free. Then you see horror stories of, you know, people getting, you know, in the hospital for coronavirus treatment for two, three weeks. They got a million dollar bill. Um, theoretically, the vaccine should be free, but you know what country we live in. Do you think that this will be widely distributed? And completely free for all Americans? We'll see. Uh, you know, I think that there are, you know, if you listen to the folks that are anti-vax, which I don't, by the way, but if you do, you know, th there's a whole control factor there that they're very concerned about. And you know what? I'm not stupid enough to completely write everything that they say off. I'm not anti-vax, though. So it would be crystal clear. So I think that there is some potential there. Um, you know, if, if, if you're just keeping yourself reasonably alert, not over alert, you know, overly doing it, but just keep yourself in a reasonable space. There is something to be said for control. The flip side to that is, is that I think that it makes sense that the federal government will pay for this. Um, do I think it'll be completely free? I don't know. Just like any other vaccine. I mean, it, this is an emergency. They're shutting the economy down. It's very possible it could be free. I don't, when I say free, it won't be free. Somebody will pay for it. It just won't be us, hopefully. I have, I have a feeling that this will become a government sanction thing. I, I think that the pressure will be just too great to, to allow it to be a pay-for thing. And uh, I lied. One more. You know, it's interesting to me. <laughs> Joe Biden won, so all of a sudden, Russia didn't interfere with the election. There's no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't hear anything about Russia interfering with the election. Uh, it's, it's like the Russian threat has suddenly disappeared 
we went from the worst, no, most horrible elections possible to suddenly they're all above board. Everything's perfect. Hunky dory, in fact, right? Yeah. I mean, anybody that bought into the Russia gate stuff, I really, I, you know, I feel for you because that means that you're, you're like one of those people that hangs on to Rachel Maddow and just sort of listens and eats that stuff up and, I feel bad for you. But then again, it, we are the most propagandized country in the world. So it's very hard for me to get too angry at the population for being clueless about so much and believing, just believing things. They've got a very limited amount of time that they can invest in learning. And and unfortunately, the people that they're supposed to be able to trust are untrustworthy. So yeah, Russiagate was pretty funny. I, I In retrospect, it's a complete... I, I just I, I can't even imagine how it stuck at all personally other than the propagandized world that we're in. But, yeah, clearly it's just vanished, hasn't it? Uh, it's it's maddening. But I'm sure, you know, if the Democrats lose uh, these two runoffs in Georgia, I'm sure maybe they'll re- it'll be they'll resurrect it. <laughs> um, where could people find out more and, and check out Real Progressives? Yeah, please come to our website, www.realprogressives.org. Please, please, please check out my podcast, Macro, the letter N, cheese. It is 94 episodes in, and it is, I promise you folks, it is better than The Queen's Gambit. <laughs> it's really good. It's, wor- it's better than a binge on Netflix. I've, I've put everything I've got into this, and our team has put everything we've got. If we experts, please check out this podcast. I promise you it's worth your time. Um, and also, you know, Find us on YouTube and find us on Rockfin and Twitter, you name it. So please do follow us, but please do check out the podcast. It's worth it. And uh, thank you, Jordan, for having me on. I really appreciate it. And yes, uh, definitely. You know, I think we saw it in the primary when corporate media just literally carried Joe Biden's politically dead carcass over the line, which is why it's more important than ever uh, to support independent media uh, whether it's us, whether it's Steve, you know, if you can support more than one outlet, uh, definitely, definitely do it. Because, uh, you know, if we're going to win progressive, uh, the, the war for progressive legislation, you also have to win the information war. And that's a whole other topic. So uh, thank you, Steve. We'll have you back soon. Got it, man. Thanks, Jordan. Okay. Bye bye. Take care. So that was Steve Grumbine of Real Progressives. Always love, love talking to Steve. Um, he's great. Uh, and I think he's one of the few that actually talks about modern, modern monetary theory uh, out there in the country. So definitely, definitely check out Real Progressives. 